While I was flying today, I had some vibrations in my FPV camera, um, which is it's really kind of unusual uh, for you to see vibrations in your FPV camera. Usually the lower resolution of the standard def camera uh, makes it, let, that's the last place you'll see vibrations. If you see them there, it's really bad. Um, so I wanted to talk you through how I'm going to troubleshoot this. Uh, the first thing I did is I needed to figure out whether those vibrations were really uh, present in the copter or whether they were maybe for maybe my FPV camera was loose and it was vibrating, right? So I checked my FPV camera and it was tight. Uh, and then the other thing I did is I looked at my high def recordings and I saw that yes, in fact, I could see the vibration in the high def recording. So if I'm seeing the vibration in both the high def and the FPV camera, then that proves that it's not just a, a loose lens on the camera or something like that. It's definitely something that's happening to the copter. So to start off with, I'm just gonna show you uh, an example of vibration so you can see what I was dealing with. Um, and then, uh, then we'll go through the troubleshooting. So I think you'll agree it's pretty bad. Um, so where do we go from here? Well, the next place I'd like to go from here is I'd just like to take a look at my black box recordings and see if I can see a difference between like a previous day when I wasn't getting this kind of noise and today. All right, so this is the last black box log from my last flight today. And you can see how it ended <laughs> in a tree. <laughs> uh, and I've got the gyros up and let's just zoom out to 10% and see what we can see. Mm. Well, the yaw axis is super noisy. Let's see if we can compare it to another video or another log from, let's see, let's grab this one and see if it looks any different. And I would say that that doesn't look as thick. If we look at this line here, I would say that that doesn't look as thick. So I think the vibration has gotten worse. All right, so let's go on to the testing and, and take it from there. All right, so here I am in my motors tab. Uh, I have got my copter plugged in. I did have to re-enable my accelerometer. If you've got your accelerometer disabled for any reason, you're going to need to turn it back on again to run this test because all this, uh, this data comes off the accelerometer. So we'll reset that. Um, I'm going to plug in my battery. And then I've got my props off. This is essential, uh, not just for safety, but because we want to measure first the motors, not the props, okay? Um, so uh, I've got my safety uh, switch flipped. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to spin up each motor one by one, and I'm going to look at the accelerometer. And you'll notice the accelerometer has a max hold here. I'm just going to reset that real quick. I must have bumped my copter. When I spin it up, I'm not going to want to jam it to full and back down again because there can sometimes be harmonics at certain uh, throttle positions. And so I'm going to want to slide, not not too slowly, because you don't want to spin full full throttle with no prop on because the motor may spin at too high of an RPM, not be good for it. But um, you're definitely going to want to move it smoothly but definitively through the range. Ready? Okay, and we see here we got 0 0.01, 0 0.01, and 0 0.02. Okay, next, motor two. Point oh four, point oh five, and point oh seven. Point oh two, point oh three, point oh five. Let me reset here. Oh, that one is good. So motors number one and four are clean as a whistle. Motors two and three are a little bit suspicious. And you might, you notice this one's the worst in the Z axis. It doesn't matter which axis it is. Um, I suppose if you really dug into it, you could conclude that some axes were worse than others. But any axis that is over a certain amount is going to be causing you problem. All right. So uh, I can conclude that motors one and four are great. And motors two and three 
are both pretty questionable. Uh, I think two might be a little worse than three. Bear in mind, though, that my guideline is that 0.03g or less is great and 0.10g or more is bad. So none of these motives is definitively bad. They're all sort of in the range of, of questionable, to, to, but not awful. All right, so let's get this motor off of here and see what we can see. Actually, it's, it's this number, number two motor. With my sunny skies, you can actually take the bell off just by undoing the grub screw. With these RCX motors, in addition to, these are the 2206s by the way, in addition to having the grub screws, they appear to be uh, some kind of adhesive holding them on. And as a result, you have to take the motor base off and take the C-clip off the shaft in order to, uh, in order to get at them. There are various tools you can use to get these C-clips off. Um, a suggestion I've always heard is to do it in a, in a plastic bag to try to, yeah, that's not gonna work, that's not gonna do it. To do it in a plastic bag so you don't lose your C-clip if it goes flying. I usually, I don't do that because it seems kind of like a hassle, but I just take a screwdriver and go at it basically just try and get it in there and work it off I do think I oh there it went well I'll have to go back and find that all right it did come off though and um, now I should be able to separate the base from the bell by the way, you can see why those motors, uh, the bases sometimes deform. You can see that it is super, there's just nothing to the base there. So, um, all right, so one thing I like to do, let me just put that back on there. One thing I like to do is I like to just check for, oh, I've lost my, my lower bearing here. Oops, we'll just set that aside. I like to check for, this is gonna be hard to do. Let me see if I can move my light and make it easier. I like to just look at the gap between the base and the bell and spin the motor as I do and see that the gap stays the same. It's really hard to capture this on camera, but if the gap goes up and down, now I've lost my bearing here, so I'm, I'm cheating a little bit. Let me put that bearing back on. But you see in, in concept what I'm talking about. that bearing back in. There we go. So I'll put that bearing in and I will put the motor back on. There we go. And then if I hold it just right and watch that gap as I spin the motor, I should see that the gap doesn't change. All right, well, I, I think I've given you the idea, um, the general idea. And if that, if the bell is deformed in any way, that gap will not be consistent. So, so now we'll take the bell off, and we'll set that aside, and let's just examine the bell for any sort of gunk or dirt or anything that might have gotten in there that's imbalancing it. Now you can see the blue, this is the balancing uh, goop that they use in their dynamic balancing machine and we're gonna look and I can see I do have um, let, me get, let me get something that's not magnetic here I do have a little bit of grass up in here let me get that out of there and there's no other real dirt or anything like that Nothing really, no magnets have come loose. Everything looks pretty solid. 
So I'm just going to get any little pieces of dirt or anything I can find in there, out of there. Anything that might be imbalancing it, basically. Um, it doesn't take very much when you're spinning at 25,000 RPM to throw you off. It really doesn't. Um, so I feel pretty confident uh, from my my test spinning it and checking for checking the gap that the uh, that the bell is not deformed and that the shaft is straight. Uh, if either of those things were the case, we would probably see the gap between the the base and the bell fluctuate as I spun the motor. You really you have to spin them by hand, by the way. If you spin them, um, if you just spin them up electrically, they spin too fast and it just becomes a blur. Obstructions and dirt on the windings are not as big a deal because the windings don't spin, right? They don't spin around. So if there's dirt or gunk up in there, I don't think that's as big a deal. The bearings feel smooth, so I don't think that they got anything going on here with the bearings. Oh boy, that one just keeps coming out, doesn't it? By the way, you ever had motors that you had to like press the bearings out? These are not them. <laughs> they feel smooth. So I could change the bearings just on principle, but I don't think I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna just try and clean the gunk off the bell. I think the bell may be just imbalanced from dirt and gunk. I don't know. Uh, in case you care, you can see that the the bottom bearing just drops right out. You can use any sort of focus, focus, please. Thank you. You can use any sort of tool to get in there. Maybe like a just kind of angle a Allen wrench a little bit and kind of pull it out. And the top bearing comes out the same way. Um, and you just got to kind of get one of them out, kind of angle it a little and push it out. If you ever do need to change the bearings, it's really a piece of cake. On some motors, you have to press them out very hard. Um, uh, but these seem pretty easy. So uh, that's so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, the bearings feel all right. The bell does not look like it's deformed. I'm going to check the bell a little closer to see if the bell or the shaft is deformed. I'm going to clean the bell out, and I'm going to hope that it comes back in the line. Um, if I can't get it straightened out, I may replace the motor, which thankfully these motors aren't too expensive. But at the very least, the, the base should be fine. Um, if I had a... Uh, if I had a better caliper, I could uh, I could check them for roundness, but I don't have one, so there you go. All right, so that's that's that. I hope that was helpful, and as always, happy flying.